This is Easy Does It Barbecue with your host, Dan McDonald, owner of Colorado Barbecue Outfitters. If you're ready to dig into some serious talk about all things barbecue, from the moo to the oink, grab a cold one and let's get down to business. Now, here's Dan McDonald. Hi, everyone. You're listening to the Easy Does It Barbecue Show. We call it that because we talk about the easiest way to do barbecue and all things uh having to do with outdoor cooking. My name is Dan McDonald. I'm the owner and operator of Colorado Barbecue Outfitters, located at 5921 North Academy Boulevard, right here in Colorado Springs. Today's topic is something near and dear to my heart because I am a little bit of a history buff myself, especially with regard to the state's history, which is very rich, but we're gonna talk about the history of barbecue. Uh, We're gonna talk about what we know of the history of barbecue is in general. And then I'm also gonna get into a little bit of our state's history which I think you're going to find that a little surprising and kind of interesting about Colorado barbecue and how it got started. So first of all, let's talk about barbecue just in general or that method of cooking. One of the things that I've got to point out is barbecue really came from a necessity. It wasn't a luxury. It wasn't something that we did thousands of years ago because we loved smoked meats or anything like that. We did it because up until about the 1800s, refrigeration did not exist. And as most of you know, if you've ever left a chunk of meat out on a hot summer day on the counter, uh, it'll go very ripe, very very, very quickly. So imagine for thousands of years hunting meat and having to consume it very quickly, especially in the summertime. Uh, So what we found out was that smoking meat It wasn't really, again, about flavor, folks. It was about uh, survival because it was a form of curing meat. It it extracted moisture out of the meat, especially when you're talking about making jerky and things like this. I always pictured, and I I talk about in my barbecue classes at my store, that I always uh, uh, pictured thousands, tens of thousands of years ago, the cavemen were out hunting. They see a deer at the top of a cliff and they shoot their bow and arrow into the deer, and the deer falls off of a cliff into the ocean. And it takes them a couple hours to climb down the cliff to to get to the carcass that has now been sitting in the ocean for a few hours and has washed up on shore. And they take it back to camp, and uh, the women of the camp were the, the cooks back then. And, and you know, they processed the deer and, and started to cook it. And they probably realized, wait a minute, this is a little different than what we normally have. And, and this is how, in my perception, brining came to be. So most of the things through humanity that we've done uh, are, quite frankly, through happenstance. I told a story last week during the charcoal segment about cavemen walking through a burnt down forest and and having unlimited supplies of charcoal. But more importantly, they most likely had to come across a charred animal carcass. And, you know, back then uh, they didn't go shopping for food as easy as we do now. They had to hunt and gather it and they were not going to let that go to waste. And they realized that that cooked food was actually very good. We also have realized that smoking meats or cooking meats uh, really played a large part in the evolution of our our species. Uh, When they cooked the meat, they could eat it quicker than when it was raw. It didn't have ill effects that raw meat obviously can have. Um, It provided more calories and can provide more protein. And uh, this allowed for bigger brains over generations and generations that led us to where we are now. You know, the, the direct history of barbecue is really, it's not documented. Um, I think because just as I said, it was really a necessity. Um, you know, we figured out we could cook meats. When we cooked the meat, it preserved a little longer. We could cure the meats by smoking uh, Native Americans. It was very popular for a lot of Native Americans to uh, make jerky out of their uh, out of their hunt and their kills. And because a lot of uh, uh, tribes back then were, were very... Uh, they moved a lot. Uh, And so jerky was an easy way to get good protein, to get good calories, and it was portable. And it lasted for days and days. So it was just a a great snack. It was a great thing for for tribes back then to to live off of. Uh, And that was basically probably your first forms of what we now call barbecue. Granted, it was done a little differently, but uh, it's essentially what it was. You got to remember, folks, that nowadays you go out you plug your, your, you probably plug your charcoal grill in, you push a button, it self lights. 
Uh, it probably maintains its own temp in some way. Uh, it can be through Wi-Fi or, or goodness knows how. And, and you can cook your food in the comfort of your home. You can lay on the couch. Well, 150 years ago, it meant chopping wood. It meant drying the wood. It meant creating a fire. Uh, it meant maintaining the fire. Uh, you know, it was a lot of work to barbecue. It's so much easier now, needless to say. So it was something that was, you know, it was not something we rushed into and just did for leisure. Again, it was really more just out of a requirement for survival. The first cooked meat uh, we have found was basically estimated about a million years ago. And this is just through carbon dating, through uh, uh, last week I talked about one of the charcoal uses was artwork. And of course, we've all heard of, of, of charcoal art that was painted on cave walls. And, uh, and it goes back quite a ways where we saw um, use of, of, of cooking meat. I told you about the uh, what I call the forest fire parable, if you will, where we imagine that you know, they walked around and came across the charred carcass and tried it. Uh, it could have been as simple as they were eating their raw meat around the campfire to stay warm and somebody dropped their meat into the fire by mistake. And the time it took to get the meat out to consume it, obviously it was essentially cooked or charred and tasted different than eating the meat raw, as you can imagine. Cooking was very essential, as I mentioned, to human evolution. And, and so again, a lot of the history of barbecue wasn't specifically doing something for an end result. Uh, it was more about, I can't emphasize this enough about survival back then. We learned that uh, smoking meats kept bugs off of it. Bugs don't like to lay eggs on meat that, <laughs> that has been smoked. So, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, the, the Spaniards came across in boats across the Atlantic. And one of the first places they landed was in the Caribbean. And in the Caribbean, they were cooking a lot of their uh, different creatures they have down there could be lizards could have been just about anything and the way they did it is they had what they called barbacoa which i imagine as as you can figure out sounds a lot like barbecue uh, so it is a it is a fairly given um, estimation that that might be where the word barbecue came from although we don't have a specific direct correlation but they used to put sticks up above the fire and they put them high enough so that the sticks would not ignite so they were basically in the smoke and they would lay their whatever meat it was uh, down in the Caribbean uh, and they would lay it on the sticks. And the smoke just happened to be sort of a lucky happenstance from w trying to keep bugs and creepy crawlies off the meat. And uh, so smoked meat, the Spaniards tried this and, and realized how, how wonderful this was. They ended up taking obviously a lot of what they learned back to Europe uh, and, and a lot of things were done over in Europe that way. There was a gentleman that was uh, by the name of Benjamin Thompson, who was an Englishman, that uh, he actually, uh, not many people know of this gentleman, but he is basically the creator of the modern fireplace. He put a flue in back, you know, hundreds of years ago, folks. You had a fireplace in your house, and that was pretty natural, but there was no flue. And so there was nothing that, you know, the smoke was supposed to go up the chimney, but oftentimes if it was windy outside, it would blow the smoke back into the, to the living quarters. And so you can imagine how unpleasant that might have been. Mr. Thompson realized that if you put a flue in the fireplace and you narrowed it at a point, it was pushing that, that hot air quickly up and the flue could regulate it. And you could actually regulate some of the heat that was kept in, in the uh, living quarters and it caused a lot of the smoke to go up out the chimney. And so he was very well known for that. He is considered uh, the inventor of the kitchen range. Now it's not obviously the kitchen range we use now. Um, he also is the inventor of the portable field stove. So if any of you have ever gone backpacking or camping or hunting and have cooked on a small stove, uh, just know you have Benjamin Thompson to thank for that. He's also the inventor of just the simple baking oven, meaning ambient heat, not, not direct heat as we mainly were cooking over fires at that time, but indirect ambient heat. And uh, of course, that is another direct correlation to how we barbecue now. Once this practice came back to Europe, there was something called a bottle or a roasting jack. And way back, they used to have the uh, oldest son of the household turned the spit. So what I'm referring to is what we call today a rotisserie, but it was called a bottle or roasting jack. And once that fireplace concept 
took off where you could get a higher heat going up the chimney, you could place this roasting jack or what we call a rotisserie and you could put your kill of the day, a rabbit on there. And then rather than burning one side and not the other, you could obviously turn it slowly. And it was human powered back in the, in the day. Believe it or not, in 1576, there was something called a turn spit dog. And there was a particular breed that no longer exists anymore. But this breed of dog was put in, and some of you may think this may sound cruel in today's standards, but it was very normal back then to put this dog in a large wheel, just like a hamster wheel, and it literally turned the spit. The child that used to do it could now be used for household work and or bringing an in income. Hello there, children. So again, it was a matter of survival and just a good way to cook for the, for the family uh, at that time. So again, Benjamin Thompson, is is really one uh, considered one of the unexpected fathers of of uh, of outdoor cooking and barbecuing. Who's your daddy and what does he do? One of the things that has been written about Mr. Thompson is he had a shoulder of mutton, which is very much like a you know like a pork shoulder or a shoulder uh, pork butt or Boston butt, and uh, at 212 degrees, because Mr. Thompson was very interested in how heat affected different things. 212 degrees, he cooked that shoulder of mutton for four hours, and it was still so tough, he gave up. He turned that mutton of shoulder over to the uh, cook maids in the kitchen at the time, and they just left it. They just, they just ignored it and let it go all night. Well, as you can imagine, you're talking about the first low and slow cook of a very thick cut of meat. And uh, when they tried it in the morning, it was absolutely delicious. So now you've got, in, in the history of, of cooking, now we have uh, from just plain old open flame to more controlled heat issues with chimneys, then we've got rotisserie that we could put meat over and it's cooking more evenly. The, the fat is rendering from the food dripping down into the fire. It's vaporizing and it's creating, it's bringing flavor back up to the meat. And so it was just a wonderful way to cook and it was rather simple for the most part, especially when you have the family dog turn the spit for you. One of the things that I think is sometimes shocking uh, to people uh, to find out is that the world's first pit masters were female. This is going back tens of thousands of years. Obviously, you know, the old uh, stereotype of the men went out and hunted and they, they you know, they were the, the hunters and the gatherers. And then the women, when they brought the food back, they were the ones that, that did the slaughtering and the pr preparation of meat for the clan. Uh, it wasn't just a family at that time. It was a group of people just literally trying to stay alive day to day. And uh, they were some of the ones that learned about cooking meats different ways. Some of it, I said, was happenstance, and some of it was, uh, you know, people just trying different things. But we can thank the uh, females of our society for being some of the pit masters that, that came out. I think that's awesome. Another, another popular method that was used um, years ago, and again, this was through trial and error, folks. You know, they would take a whole pig and they would put it over charcoal. And, uh, you know, you need to take a whole pig and cook it for many, many hours. And that was difficult. If you put it over charcoal, you'd burn one side, you'd have to turn it. I mean, a pig can weigh 150 pounds. So having the dog or the young kid do it may not have worked. So along the way, they realized that, you know, when, if you've ever had a campfire and you let that campfire burn down at night, and you get up in the morning and you dig down a couple inches, it still very well could have very hot coals in there. And it wasn't easy to figure that out. Um, uh, basically, what they figured out is if you could, if that would stay hot that long, they could cook meat that long. However, they couldn't just put the meat in there right over the coal because it would burn. So in some of the tropical areas, they took banana leaves and soaked the banana leaves, and then they wrapped it around the meat. They dug a big pit in the ground or a big open hole, and they just created a huge fire and let it burn down to coals. And then they would put the meat wrapped in the banana leaves above the coals. The banana leaves insulated the meat. Uh, then they would throw dirt over that and literally bury it in the ground. They had the most beautiful beach and they built the biggest sand castles you ever saw. Uh, it's very popular at luau's in Hawaii. And How about a lobster luau? A lot of Pacific Islanders followed this, this method. And it was just a matter of cooking a large pig or whatever the animal was at the time for many hours. Um, so it was kind of the precursor to the low and slow and, and more than likely where the term 
pit probably came from. You're listening to the Easy Does It Barbecue Show. My name is Dan McDonald, owner and operator of Colorado Barbecue Outfitters. Another thing that happened years ago, prior to humans basically coming up with what we now know as metal, is we speculate that, you know, again, a couple thousand years ago or when, where, whenever um, a piece of ore was dropped into a charcoal uh, fire or, or a cooking pit, again, uh, and we noticed that, that because the charcoal burns hotter, especially if it's introduced with more oxygen, it burned hotter that that ore oozed metal. This group is hotter than hot. And so what happened is after it burned off, it was left with basically a chunk of metal. We then realized that this chunk of metal uh, is how we extracted bronze. And so we had the Bronze Age start. And it doesn't take much to figure out that once we were able to make bronze weapons, uh, bronze things, to metal things to help us with everyday life, uh, humanity changed a great deal at that time. The Bronze Age led into the Iron Age. And uh, I get a little off topic of, of talking about charcoal and outdoor cooking, but um, what happened was is, is that the charcoal at that time was used by blacksmith to uh, you know, to obviously to make different metal items and things like that. So all of this stuff is really in, kind of tied together in somewhat of an indirect way. But it's really interesting to see over the course of humanity how all of this kind of panned out. At least it is to me. Many of us enjoy the celebration. Few of us know the history behind it. But again, I'm a history buff, folks. Again, basically, it, it's there is no documented s specific uh, barbecue origin. A lot of it just came, as I said before, through happenstance. But the modern use of barbecue is really kind of speculated to be, as I mentioned, the Spaniards coming to the Caribbean, uh, seeing what they called barbacoa, taking it back. And then it came back to the States during the uh, colonial days. Um, what happened at that time, a lot of livestock was raised. Obviously, they would butcher it. Uh, uh, the meat would be cut up um, and then it would be sold to the public. A lot of this was done, you know, down south. Um, I t talk about in my barbecue classes that, that I hold that, you know, a couple hundred years ago, there were cuts of meat that we pay big money for now. Uh, one of them happens to be brisket. Uh, that can be as somewhat, sometimes as expensive as $10 or more a pound. Well, back then, butchers didn't know what to do with it. It was a very heavy cut of meat. Uh, it was very dense. Um, you, you would cook it for a few hours and it would be worthless because it would be too chewy. So they threw, if you can believe this, folks, they threw those heavy cuts of meat out. They would throw the brisket right out the back in the trash. And the uh, less fortunate, which in the South at the time happened to be a, a lot of the slaves, would grab that meat just, again, out of survival and cook it for their families. Um, a lot of the plantation owners... Uh, once they discovered this low and slow, when they saw the slaves cooking these big chunks of meat, uh, obviously it kind of perked their, their noses up. They would smell it and they would hear about it and, and they would demand to try it. And then many of them would take what they felt was the best, what we now call pit master uh, of their you know group of slaves and have them cook for them. Uh, and so this is basically how, how barbecue sort of came to be in our country. Um, not what not only was it out of necessity, but um, it was just a matter of, of people trying new things and then that quite frankly being exploited by by others. Um, as our country grew and the West opened up, people needless to say started started moving west. You had the large hubs that were located. Uh, Kansas City being a very big one, locate a lot of railroads were coming into it, a huge river going through it. so there was a lot of migrants. Uh, that were coming through Kansas City. Uh, Kansas City is one of the regions that are known as uh, basically barbecuing everything. And the reason being is because people brought all of those everything barbecue skills to, to that town. I want to talk a little bit about the history of barbecue in Colorado. We see a lot of regional barbecue out west. And, and, and the reason being is uh, because I just said, you know, a lot of people moved out west and brought those cooking techniques with them. Now, the only problem was is regional barbecue tends to use a certain kind of wood. Now, the reason they do that is because that wood is very plentiful. The perfect example of that is down in Texas, mesquite is a basically a shrub for all practical purposes, a small tree that grows down there, but it's essentially a weed. 
it just grows nonstop in that environment down in the Oklahoma and Texas and New Mexico and Arizona areas. So when, when Texans, who I absolutely adore, say mesquite is the only wood to use because it tastes so good, I have to remind them, well, you only use it because you can walk outside and pick it up off the ground. Um, not a lot of states have that, you know, are, are fortunate enough to do that. I, I grew up in Michigan, and uh, my dad used to just tell me, go go out in the woods and, and, and pick up, you could pick up all the oak that you wanted. It, it was a huge abundance of, uh, of red oak that was located up there. Um, we also have Michigan is very well known for a lot of its uh, cherries that come out of that state. And so there's a lot of cherry trees that, that are there that you can come across as well. But uh, so most of the regional barbecue came to be just simply because of the resources they had at the time. Uh, hickory is very prominent in the Midwest. Uh, you've got red oak and alder out on the West Coast. So alder comes from the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's, it's very abundant up there. It just so happens the Pacific Northwest uh, does eat a lot of seafood. There is a lot of uh, wonderful salmon that comes out of the Pacific Northwest. And they just, the two just were married up to each other. You used alder, which is a lighter wood for delicate meats such as seafood or, or fish. Uh, California has red oak in abundance. And so obviously they're going to use that uh, to barbecue with. The Santa Maria style of, of barbecuing and, and a particular cut of meat really made popular by the state of California, and that was tri-tip. And there are some states on the East Coast that even in 2021, it hasn't made it that far yet, or they call it something different. But So a lot of this came to be through the resources they had at, at, in their area and, uh, and, and you know taking that with you. Now you can imagine a couple hundred years ago, again, you had to cut the wood, you had to let it dry. Uh, there was a lot of work that went into what we would call true barbecue today. Uh, in the state of Colorado, as beautiful as this state is, as much as I love it, we do not really have good natural wood to smoke with. We essentially have mainly three types of wood that is naturally here in our state, evergreens, and that's going to encompass all of your pines and blue spruce, you know, all that, your evergreens. We have scrub oak, which when I moved here, I thought, oh boy, look at all this scrub oak. I can use it. And it doesn't work so great. It's not like regular oak. Um, it it has a, tends to have a bitter taste to it. And then we have aspens, which is one of the, the largest living uh, entities in the world. And unfortunately, all three of those do not make great barbecue woods. So back in the 1800s, if you wanted to barbecue in Colorado, just like you really have to do in 2021, you had to import the wood. And you can imagine how expensive that was and how hard that was to do for the first barbecue restaurants that started pretty much in the Denver area. You know, Denver was kind of the hub to the West. A lot of, again, railroads, a lot of migrants, come, a lot of immigrants coming through that migrating to the west we had the gold rush which just blew the west up but it didn't mean we still had good barbecue wood here uh, so that was the challenge with colorado it, and, it, and it's interesting because we do have a very large beef industry or a large meat industry we, we just don't naturally produce the good woods to cook it with which i think is very very ironic um, here in our state so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the history of, of barbecue in Colorado, and it dates back to the 1800s as Denver was coming to be. There were three main barbecue-related incidents that took place. One of those that, that we the first recorded or the first reported public barbecue in Colorado happened on January 8th in 1863. Uh, the, at the time, the Colorado's Democratic Party was holding its political convention in Golden, uh, in Golden City. Well, it was called Golden City back then. It was actually then the capital of Colorado territory before we uh, became a state. Uh, that party threw an event uh, that the Weekly Commonwealth, which was, that was the Denver newspaper at the time, uh, deemed, and I quote, the first barbecue ever given in Colorado. Um, on the menu, they had ox and pig, because that's, again, what we had a lot of, of at the time. The largest barbecue in Colorado that has been recorded took place also in Denver. There was a gentleman uh, called Columbus B. Hill, or he was referred to as C.B. Hill. This was a gentleman that came from West Tennessee, and he brought that southern style of cooking to Colorado. 
Now, I don't know what wood he used. I don't know how he sourced his wood. I, I imagine he might have just used recommended lumber. Uh, at that time, lumber wasn't really being treated, so it was a little safer. So I imagine he was doing that of lumber that was probably brought in from other regions. What happened was, is on July 4th, 1890, C.B. Hill was going to do a barbecue to sell in Lincoln Park to celebrate the laying of the cornerstone for the state capitol. They were, they were expecting about, I don't know, maybe 5,000 or so so people, and they literally ended up with 50 to 60,000 people that were jammed in that park. On the menu, which I thought was an interesting tidbit, and this was recorded with 350 sheep, 312 cattle, 15,000 loaves of bread, 3,000 pounds of cheese, 10 barrels of pickles, and thousands of gallons of lemonade. So if you think your barbecue is a lot of work and a lot of meat, just remember what C.B. Hill went through. Real quickly, the wildest barbecue, and unfortunately this one didn't really end too well, but in 1898, the stock show, which was January 27th, in a bid to become the, the permanent home for the stock show in Denver, they threw a barbecue. They sold 5,000 advance tickets, but unfortunately, what happened was is Lower Denver, or Lodo, we called it, comprised at that time was a very low-income, poverty-level stricken part of Denver. The word got out that there were going to be free food, and about thirty to 50,000 people stormed what was intentionally a 5,000-person barbecue. Um, a food riot, believe it or not, ensued, and there were many people injured, and I believe there was one recorded death. So that was not a barbecue to be proud of in our state, but it's also an indication of how popular barbecue was even back then. Folks, this has been a, a brief history of barbecue, as well as a brief history of Colorado barbecue. We do have many restaurants in the El Paso County, and especially in the Denver market. And a lot of these restaurants, as I alluded to, tend to be regional barbecue. I don't know or believe that there is such a thing that is specifically Colorado specific barbecue. A lot of the barbecue we offer is either Kansas, style, Texas style, Carolina style, Memphis style, you name it. But again, because we didn't really have the uh, raw materials to have an origin of barbecue in our state. Thank you for listening. Today's show, again, is sponsored by Colorado Barbecue Outfitters at 5921 North Academy Boulevard. Stop in anytime. We'd love to chat with you. Thanks for listening to Easy Does It Barbecue, brought to you by Colorado Barbecue Outfitters, specializing in pellet grills, charcoal grills, electric smokers, sauces, rubs, and barbecue accessories. Online at 719BBQ.com. See you next Saturday at 1 for Easy Does It Barbecue. And listen to the podcast on Podbean.